I want to ask you a question today. What does it mean to repent? Sometimes people obey the gospel and then they go astray very quickly. Sometimes maybe it's just because of the influence of the world. But other times it may be because they never fully repented. Could you be a person today who says, I have repented and changed my life? What we're going to talk about are two sons today who were told to go work in God's vineyard. One of them repented and the other one did not. Let's talk about these two sons from Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28 today. Hope that you'll stay tuned as we talk about it in just a moment. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And now, Josh McCrary, the gospel is gold. There was a five-year-old son. He asked his father at the dinner table. He said, Dad, are bugs good to eat? Well, Dad was sort of old-fashioned. He said, son, don't talk about eating bugs at the dinner table. Well, the son didn't say anything else after that. So, After dinner was over, they gathered around in the living room, and Dad asked the son, he said, son, what did you want to tell me earlier? The son said, well, Dad, there was a bug in your soup, but it's okay, you ate it. <laughs> you know, some things are hard to swallow. None of us would go outside and want to eat bugs, really. And I want to tell you today that there is something in the Bible that's hard to swallow. It's called repentance. It's a very tough subject when it comes to your heart. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 21, Elijah gathered 400 prophets of Baal. And in essence, he told them they needed to repent. And in fact, he mentioned and he said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve Him. If Baal, then serve Him. And the people answered him not a word. You see, they could not swallow the fact that they may just be following the religion of their families, worshiping idols, sacrificing to idols, instead of doing what is right. Too many times people learn what they are supposed to do, but it's so hard for them to swallow, they're not willing to make the changes. It's very tough, the idea of repentance, but I hope today that we will make the choice to do what's right. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua said, But if it seem evil to you this day, choose you whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, which they served on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made the choice. And I hope that all of us will make that same choice. That if God says, I want you to do this, that we will be willing to turn our ways from the devil and go to God. That is repentance. I want to share with you this poem before we begin in Matthew chapter 21. I invite your attention to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28, which will serve as our text. But I want to share with you this poem before we begin. No greater lessons learned than the ones earned by the two sons. A man cannot be content until he learns how to repent. So when God asks, I pray that I will go and that I will not be a no-show. Neither was hurt or injured, but they both did not want to work in the vineyard. But one allowed repentance to change his mind. And I pray for a desire for repentance is what I will find. Friend, I hope that you and I both make a decision today that if anything is ever wrong in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, that we will be willing to say, Lord, I just want to change it and I want to fix it. That attitude is known as repentance. You'll find this taught in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28 when Jesus taught a parable about two sons. Here's what he said. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came and said to the first, Go ye and work in my vineyard. And he said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? And they said unto him, The first. 
And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that publicans and harlots shall go into the kingdom of God before you, because John came in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him, and that ye, when you had seen it, you repented not afterward, that you would believe him. It's interesting to me that believing him is synonymous with going to work in his vineyard. You see, obeying God's command in the Bible is synonymous with believing Him because if I believe Him, I will do what He says. It's like what James said in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. You see, if I don't do what God said, faith is nothing. In fact, James asked the question, can a man be saved by faith alone? His answer was rhetorical, which is no. I hope that you and I will act upon our faith today, have an attitude of repentance in our lives, and obey what God has said. I want to give you four things today as we talk about repentance. Number one, let's talk about the command of repentance. It's interesting to me, there are three commands in this passage right here. Go work today. Go work today. Those are three commands mentioned here, and I want to talk about all three of them under the first point of the command. Me and my wife have been trying to go to the gym faithfully. Uh, sometimes this doesn't work out. We'll go for a few months and then not go and then try to get back into going again, so on and so forth. It's kind of like the guy, he said, you know, I've been healthier this week. I drove by the gym every day. <laughs> well, you have to go in. When you, when you say go to the gym, you have to go. And when God says, I want you to go, that means He says, I want you to go. It's kind of like what God said when He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I want to ask you, friend, is that part of your life? In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You know what that tells me? People can't be saved unless I go. And that's what God means when he came to the first son and he said, Go. That is your most important mission from this point on is to go. But you know, the sad truth is we get our priorities mixed up sometimes. You know, I remember a saying, somebody said, why is it that your nose runs and your feet smell? <laughs> Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't your nose smell and your feet run? <laughs> well, you know, priorities get switched around sometimes. I think about a man in Acts chapter 24. He was like that. And the Bible says that the apostle reasoned with him of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. And Felix trembled and he said, Go. Go thy way. And when I have a convenient season, I will call for you. The sad truth is, friend, it will never be convenient for a person to repent. Not one time in life will it ever be convenient. And this man thought that when, I, when it's right for me, I will repent. But the fact is, the devil will come and take his life before it's convenient. And the time that it will be convenient for Felix to repent, it will be too late at that moment. Well, the Bible says, we have to go. I want to challenge you to do something. If you're reading the Bible all the way through this year, when you get to the New Testament, I want you to read the New Testament with the idea in mind that a Christian's responsibility, his number one responsibility, is to go and preach. What you're going to find is an overwhelming amount of evidence that supports the idea of Christians going and reaching the lost. Friend, when we lose that focus, we lose our faith. And I want to encourage you today to think about what God said to the first son. He said, you need to go. There's another command. He said, go and work. 
You know, it takes effort to do God's will. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable. We have to take ourselves out of our comfort zones a little bit. But it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and beginning in verse 57, the, the apostle has been explaining through the whole chapter about the resurrection of the dead. And he says here, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking about the victory over death. But it's interesting, in the very last verse of the chapter, verse 58, he tells us what our responsibilities are until the resurrection comes. He says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God said go, but He said work. Paul told us to be always abounding in that work. And I want to ask you today, are you involved in some type of ministry for the kingdom of God in your life? That tells me it's not just enough for me to come Sunday morning and sit in that pew and get back up after the time is gone, go back home and do nothing for the kingdom of God. I want to challenge you again when you read the New Testament to read the New Testament with that idea in mind that it is our responsibility to go. It is our responsibility to do God's work. James wrote this in James 1.25. He said, Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. A doer of it. God said go. He said work. But I love this. He said today. He told that son... Go work today in my vineyard. Those are three commands. Not tomorrow. We don't plan on next week. We say, well, I'll obey the gospel next week. It's interesting to me that in Exodus chapter 3, when Pharaoh had frogs in his bed, he had frogs in the cupboards, he pulled back uh, 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 the blankets and there were frogs, he went to make his cereal in the morning and there were frogs in his cereal. There were frogs everywhere. A plague had been sent by God and Moses asked him, When shall I entreat for you to take away the frogs that they may remain in the river only? To this day, I do not understand his answer. He said, Tomorrow. Why do you want the frogs to be gone tomorrow? I don't want frogs in my cereal today. I don't want frogs in my bed today. I don't want frogs when I try to go to the bathroom today. God says, we don't need to wait till tomorrow. I remember this passage in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 15. He said, while it is said today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. Today. I'm reminded of a missionary who was contacted by a local church and they told him, they said, uh, have you found a safe road to travel? Because if you have, we will send more missionaries to you. The missionary responded back and he said, if they will only come when there's a safe road to travel, I do not want them to come. What he meant was he doesn't want those who are not willing to put in the effort. And friend, God does not want those kind of people either. I mean, God has done everything so that we would be saved from our sins. And He expects us to be about His business. Number two, He first said to this son a command. But then you'll notice the compliance. I love this part because at first you, you think the son has a bad attitude. <laughs> he came to the first. He said, go work today in my vineyard. And what did the son say? He said, I will not. And I think to myself, you better not talk to your daddy that way. <laughs> you know, boy, if you did that in my house, you'd be in big trouble. 
Uh, when I was growing up, we didn't talk back to mom or dad. But that boy, he, he sort of, you think he had a bad attitude, you know. He said, I'm not going. But the Bible says, afterward, he repented and went. This word repented, it, it's a combination of two words in the original language. Uh, the first word is a preposition. It means after. And then the next word is uh, the word to care. So what you have under this point is uh, he repented, he had aftercare. You know, he, he walked away from his father and he thought, my father sure has been good to me. I've got a place to sleep, everything I want to eat. He loves me. I should have gone in the vineyard. You know, he was right. He should have gone. At least he had mind enough about himself to change his mind. You see, that's what repentance is. Repentance takes place right here. It says, you know, God loves me. He's given me everything. He gave his son so that I could live eternally with him. And you see a man's mind begin to change. He says, I'll obey God. That's repentance. He makes the decision to be a servant of God. There was a woman who asked the preacher, she said, what do you think it means to be a Christian? The preacher, he didn't know how to answer this, you know. He, he thought, well, what is the best answer I could give this lady? I, I want to give her something that she's going to remember. He took a piece of paper and he, said, he drew a line. He said, I want you to sign your name right there. She signed her name. He said, being a Christian means that you sign your name and you let God fill in the rest. That's a pretty good definition, isn't it? That's what this young boy did. You know, at first he said, no, I'm not going to work in vineyard. <laughs> I'm tired of working. But then he changed his mind. What motivated him to do this? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You see, there's two types of sorrow. There's a sorrow, a godly sorrow, and then the sorrow of the world. And every time I read this passage, I cannot help but think of a man by the name of Scott Peterson who murdered his pregnant wife about 10 years ago or so. And the court case was shown on national television. And while he sat in the courtroom, he had this smirk on his face. And he would just look around. And I thought to myself, I, I just wish that somebody would put him in his place. You see, he didn't have one ounce of sorrow for what he had done to his pregnant wife. It is ridiculous. But I'll tell you this, he did have a kind of sorrow. He was sorry that he got caught. That kind of sorrow, the Bible says it will lead straight to death. But a godly sorrow, a godly sorrow will work repentance in a man's heart that will lead him to salvation. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The compliance of God's will. You see? You see the command first. Go work today. And then you see the compliance working in this man's life. He turned around and he went to obey his father. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, this idea is mentioned here about turning. And in the King James, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. But some of your translations will say, Repent ye therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. And that's the idea. You know, repentance literally means you're going in one direction and you turn around. He used to be following the devil, but now he's a follower of God. Too many times people think that repentance means you're perfect. Nobody's perfect. God doesn't want you to be perfect. He wants you to repent. He wants you to begin following Him. What you'll find is your life becoming more and more stable as the years go on because of that decision to repent. I want to share with you this poem. 
And it's sort of interesting because sometimes church members put a difference between the life of a preacher and church members. And, and I sort of want to make this humorous, but I want you to think seriously about it too. If my life is different than yours, something's wrong. I'm just a normal guy. But too many times people think that they can get away with things, but if the preacher were to do that, then it would be wrong. For instance, would I fire the preacher if he did what I do? If all he did was miss church or skip a few? Would I fire him to hold up a standard when all he did was use my manners? Would I fire him if his attitude stinks or if he liked to have a few drinks? I feel like for him it's a crime, but for me, I do it all the time. While we put the preacher on a totem pole, if he lived like I lived, would he lose his soul? What I do, I would never want him to see. And if I were the preacher, would God fire me? Think about how powerful that is, friend. You see, it's not right for people to live separate lifestyles. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher, a, an elder in the church, a Bible class teacher. We're all Christians. And we've all made a common decision to repent. What that means is I've put those things behind me, like skipping church. Friend, I'm going to tell you, if it's wrong for the preacher to skip church, it's wrong for you. <laughs> If it's wrong for the preacher to drink, it's wrong for you. Everybody is on the same plane with God. We've all got to make that decision. Number three, I love this part too. He makes a comparison. We see the command, we see the compliance, but then you have a comparison between the two sons. Because one of them said, I will not go, but he repented. The other one said, I will go. <laughs> he never showed up. I want to ask you today, friend, let's think seriously. Are you the second son? God, remember, He said, go work today in my vineyard. Do you know what that means? That Christians have a responsibility to go and reach the lost. Are you a person who said to God, I will go. But you never went. Friend, that hits me right in the chest, and I hope it does you. We all need to go. You know, Jesus taught about a church at Laodicea. They were influenced by laziness, by the world, by sin, and they quit doing the work of God. Jesus told them to repent. You know, I'm reminded of a man. He said, uh, what do you get when you cross a cow with a shark? His friend looked at him. He said, I don't know, but I sure don't want to milk it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't either, would you? <laughs> but think about this, friend. Some people want to milk Christianity. You know, give me all the blessings from Christ, and, you know, and I'll come to church a little bit. But hey, when it comes to doing something I'm uncomfortable with, I ain't doing it. I, you know, I ain't teaching a Bible class. Now, I'm not going to lead no prayer. Now, and I'll tell you this, I'm not going lead to lead to singing. I, I can't just have Christians over at my house. You know, I, I get uncomfortable when I get around people like that. No, I sure ain't visiting a nursing home. I'll tell you that right now. I, I can't do that. There are so many works that are being neglected today because Christians have become lukewarm. You see, there's a comparison between these two sons. And one of them said, no, that's too much responsibility. I don't want to go work in the vineyard. But he repented. And then the other one, he didn't want to go either. But he told his father he would go and he never went. He was lukewarm. The Bible says about this church at Laodicea, and Jesus told him, I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. 
And I would that thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And because thou sayest, I am rich, I am increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, and knowing not that thou art wretched and poor and blind and miserable and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold that is tried in a fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and that thou would anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Notice this. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What is the cure for this attitude? What is the cure for everything in life for a man to be a follower of God? It's one huge step. It is the step of repentance. Because, friend, if you repent, you'll do anything God asks for you to do. If God said for you to swim across Pickwick Lake in order for you to go to heaven, friend, you'd be out there swimming. Repentance says, I will do anything that God says for me to do. Well, I want to move on to my fourth point. We, we've talked about, first of all, the command. We've talked about the compliance. We've talked about the comparison. But I want to talk about, in the fourth place, the completion. I love this part because Jesus asked the Pharisees on this occasion, He said, which of them did the will of His Father? And they said the right answer, the first one. Although he said he wasn't going, he did it. He repented and went. And Jesus said, which of them did the Father's will? Let's talk about that will just for a moment. Hannah Mandelikova was a famous tennis player who won, really, the world championship of tennis. And she was interviewed and she was asked what it was like to beat some of the best tennis players in the world, such as Martina Nar Narlatova and Everett Lloyd. She said, you know, all of the suffering and the traveling and the practice were all worth it at that moment. I felt like I had won the world. The interviewer asked her, she said, well, how long did that feeling last like you had won the world? Hannah said, about two minutes. <laughs> you know, she was joking, but at the same time, she was making a point. You know, just because you win a tennis championship for the entire world, it doesn't mean you've won the world. It doesn't mean you've conquered every problem there is to conquer because that feeling is only going to last for a short time. True happiness comes when a man does his Father's will. And Jesus said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of his Father in heaven. Will you do God's will today? I hope that you and I both would not be like the second son who said, I will go. But he did not. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36, the Bible says, You have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you will inherit the promise. Will you do it today? Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In order for you to do the Father's will, you've got to be added to the church so that you can be safe from the gates of Hades the only way to do that is to be baptized into Christ and to repent of your sins and believe that Jesus is the Christ and live faithful to Him. In Acts chapter 2, when the church began, He told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 47, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That tells me that the church... Being baptized, repentance, and believing, they're all connected. And I pray today that you and I will be a people who repent. Thank you so much. Amen.